Goodness. 
but he brought me and oh his love for me oh his love Thank you that you're for us and that you're not against us. Lord, that you've chosen us in Christ before the creation of the world. Lord, that you're faithful and that you're good and that you're trustworthy, Lord. Lord, I want to pray for each one today that you'll pour out your spirit afresh upon them. Because you're a good, good father. I had a, a big memory coming back uh, this morning when I, when I woke up. And uh, it was off when I was in Glasgow. And Glasgow humour is quick. N nothing against sore English humour. It's just a bit slower. And uh, you have to be quick on your feet in Glasgow. And I remember when I was in high school chaplaincy with a pastor. And this young person said to the pastor, quick as a flash, he said, McCurry, your faith's just a crutch. And my immediate reaction was, you cheeky wee teenager. <laughs> you know, how dare you say such a thing? And my friend then, McCurry said, McCurry said, response was brilliant. He said this, he said, how dare you accuse my faith of being a crutch? It's a life support machine. I love that. It was actually in the hard times of faith. Faith isn't just something that we can lean on, but it gives us everything that we need. 
Our faith in Christ gives us strength. And I've never forgotten that. That was about 12 years ago now. So your faith is just a crutch. How dare you? And it was literally within five seconds. That's why I'm saying you have to be quick. I don't know I can be that quick. I certainly couldn't. Um, but that's just Glasgow humour. But Glasgow in its best. And why am I sharing that? I think for some of you the last year has been really difficult. And it's been really painful at times. But remember, God has given you all that you need. And that God will continue to give you all that you need, that he'll never leave you, nor forsake you. And perhaps maybe in this time where it's just important just to be still for a wee bit, maybe just a couple of minutes just to be still in our Father's presence. Sometimes we're afraid of silence in churches we shouldn't be. Let's just be still. And maybe you just need to hold on to that fact. Let's just be still in our Father's presence and then I'll come and read God's word to us. Uh, we're, we're so often busy. So let's just still our hearts. And ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill you afresh. To make you pliable. To make you teachable. Maybe it's laying down things in the last year. Maybe it's coming before God with hearts. Just come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord. Lamentations 3, 19 says, As I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall, I will remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have, have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Maybe for some of you, you just need to hold on to that. doesn't deny his circumstance. He acknowledges it before God. But even in the circumstances, he could say, God, great is your faithfulness. If you've got your Bible, perhaps you can turn with me to the book of Colossians. I'm going to read uh, the word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always find God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. Faith and love that you spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. Amen. I'm going to stop there. You'll be pleased to know I'm preaching on two verses this morning. It's not really that long, is it? I don't know about you. When was the last time you got uh, your eyes tested? Uh, I'm not saying that any of you needs a, an eye test, all right? But I'm aware that I got the letter through, an email through today saying your eye test uh, said that you're needing your eye te eyes tested again. It's been two years. And in many ways, as Christians, it's really important that we have a spiritual eye test because our vision is really, really important to us. I'm short-sighted, which means I can see the things close up really, really well. But if you ask me to see Andy, I can see Andy, I can recognize Andy, but maybe not quite as clear as what I could without uh, my glasses. Or sometimes we can be long-sighted where we can see the things in the distance, but we can't see those things which are so close to us. And many ways, sometimes we have a similar approach when we read scripture, 
because sometimes it's important to read things with the big picture in mind, but we fail to see the small and significant details. But likewise, sometimes we can see small chunks that we fail to see what's going on in the bigger picture of Scripture. In Colossians, we're going to go slowly through this passage, and we're going to go slowly through the book of Colossians, because we believe as elders, but also as a wider leadership team, that we had had a lot of wide teaching, which is good, and thematic teaching, which is good, and biblical teaching, I hope, which is good. But it's also important, sometimes just simply, sometimes important, to just simply focus, to sit and reflect upon God's word. But also one of the beauties of a book like Colossians is it's only four chapters. But boy, does it pack a punch. And also one of the things about the book of Colossians is it helps get a vision, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, almost all of you, I'm sure, have heard of the late John Stahl, an amazing man of God. And he said this, that nothing is more important for the Christian than a vision or a clear vision of the authentic vision of Jesus. And that's one of the things that we find in the book of Colossians that helps us get a clear picture of Jesus Christ. And Paul writes to this group of believers in Colossae, modern-day Turkey. And the church was in its infancy, probably about 54 AD at this point, young. They, they faced pressures around them in society to conform. They, pre they faced this pressures to conform to go back to Judaism. They faced pressures to conform to the Roman Empire. But in the midst of that, Paul writes to this young group of believers and he encourages them to stand firm, to remain faithful to Christ in uncertain times. But also, to more than that, he writes to exhort them to hold on to the supremacy and the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those words are quite deliberate, supremacy and sufficiency. Because you, as we go through this letter, you'll see that there were these false teachers who came in, preached a form of Judaism and Gnosticism combined, which kind of put the people of God under pressure. We won't really go into that today. But really, kind of, they were kind of questioning, what were the marks of authentic discipleship or Christ-centered discipleship? And I, I think I've told you before, but I firmly believe that discipleship is crucial. It's not just about dare I say it, meetings, it's about helping people encounter God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul writes. He writes this letter, not dare I say it, as someone who's outside of the community, although he's never met these people. He writes to encourage them with a message. But he begins his letter and he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. And if you're a bit like me, you're asking the question, Apostle. What does that mean? It's a word that we often hear in church, isn't it? Paul and apostle. But sometimes people don't tell us what these words actually mean. The word literally means a sent one. A sent one. Someone who's been sent with a message. But the Bible, when it tells uh, there's a difference between uh, being an apostle and be having an apostolic ministry. Paul had an apostolic ministry, but an apostle was someone who bore witness to the resurrection of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. His message wasn't originated in his idea or a philosophy, but for Paul, he had been sent with a, a divine edict per se, to encourage the believers, to encourage them to stand firm to the will of God. Also too, being an apostle wasn't something that he chose, but rather that God chose him and he responded to. Being an apostle was a token of God's grace in Paul's life. And that's the thing about the apostle Paul's writing. He always writes with an atmosphere of grace and kindness. It doesn't always feel like that when you read them in Galatians, for example. It's quite harsh. 
But the message of grace was always important. But he was sent with a message to proclaim Christ Jesus by the will of God. But also too, it's interesting, Paul never often writes in isolation. Did you notice who else wrote this letter of Colossians with him? Timothy. That's got something really important to teach us. If we want to be people who stand firm together, we're a team together. Paul and Timothy. Here's an interesting fact for you. Do you know how many co-workers Paul had in the Bible? Anyone want to hazard a guess? People often think Paul was a, a lone ranger. Ten? Higher or lower than ten? Anyone want to guess? Higher? Anyone? Come on, come on, have a guess. The price is right. You know? We're all, we're, you're all getting your counts and I can see you all getting your fingers out here. There's, believe it or not, there's over 64 people that Paul uh, writes with or who exhorts who are his co-workers in his writings. Interesting. Not many people realize that. So when Paul writes, often he writes not just with an individual lens, he writes with a community lens. And this is what he does when he writes with Timothy. He writes to the believers in Colossians. He says, actually, okay, I know your situation. I'm not writing just by myself, but I'm writing with my friend Timothy. And we want to encourage you, the believers in Colossians, to stand firm. But notice how does he write to them and how does he write about them? He says, to the holy and faithful brothers. Isn't that a lovely description of the believers in Colossae? Notice Paul's warmth, how he writes about them. Firstly, he says that they were holy. Is holiness really that important in the church of the Lord Jesus today? Yes, it is. Because actually, again, what does it mean to be holy? It's a good church word, isn't it? You know, we often sing, you know, holy, holy. I won't sing anymore because I'm on camera and it's terrible, right? But actually, Scripture says, be holy as I'm holy. But still, you've not, still not told me what it does it mean to be holy. But actually, to be holy means to be totally set apart for a sacred purpose. That's what Paul writes and talks with the believers in Colossae. He says, they were set apart. Notice, that doesn't mean that they were separate. They were set apart. They were distinctive. They were different. One of my heroes in, uh, in church history is a man called Robert Murray McShane. Uh, he, he was from Dundee. He was, a, he was a, Scot a Scotsman. He was 29 when he died. But his influence was huge. And he said this. He said, a, a holy minister is an awful weapon in the hands of a mighty God. And then he later said on, later, later on in that sermon, he said this, and this is the quote that you'll know. He said, my people's greatest need is my personal holiness. And I think if that was written in true in 1850, I think that's arguably even more so true in the church of the Lord Jesus today in the, the year 2021. That actually as Christian people, we are called to be people who are set apart for God. Being distinctive, living for him, living lives of wholehearted discipleship. Because actually that's what Jesus calls us and commands us to. And that's why he writes to this group in caution. He says, actually, you are holy, but I want to encourage you to continue to be holy. Some of you may have in your Bible here in that phrase, it doesn't say holy ones. But for some of you, I might say the word saints in your Bible. Is that what it says in some of yours? Tell me if it does or if it doesn't. 
Let's say the word is interchangeable in the Greek. But what I'm going to try to say is, to be a saint isn't there, I say, a set person who's been set aside by the Pope. That's what happens to the Catholic Church. But actually, we're all saints together. We're all part of the family, the household of God. But as God's people, we are called to be people, not just as individuals, but as a community of faith, we are also called to be set apart, distinctive, different. Hebrews chapter 12 has some really sobering words, but challenging words. It says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And I, I have, I've been thinking about this in recent times, about this passage when Paul writes to encourage the believers to be holy, to be separate, to be distinctive. What did that mean in the midst of the Roman Empire when you would have pledged your loyalty and you would have pledged your allegiance to Caesar? To say, actually, I'm not going to be follow and pledge my allegiance anymore to Caesar. But actually, I'm going to pledge my, my allegiance and my loyalty to King Jesus. For many people that Paul writes to in this community in Colossae, they would have known people who'd laid down their lives for their faith. It was a supreme cost. For them to say that Caesar isn't Lord anymore, but rather Jesus is my Lord. And I think in our society that we're living in, to say Jesus is Lord of my life, to say that Jesus is going to be wholly set apart for him, that's going to become increasingly costly. So that's why this book of Colossians is so important, that we learn the lessons from it. But notice, he didn't just finish with the, the, the instruction of you're called to be holy, but he said you're called to be faithful. Did you notice that in the text, verse 2? You know, actually, they're wonderful words. And actually, the word faithful is actually an interesting word in Greek. Uh, I'm not really a Greek scholar, I want to stress it. I basically said like I know a lot, I don't, right? I pick up what I learn through reading, right? But the word faithful can be translated several ways. If it can be translated the word faith, it can be translated the word faithfulness, and often it can be, sometimes it can, and sometimes it's really hard to make this sharp distinction between the two. But what I want to say is this, in this context, I think when Paul writes, he writes to remind them that if they're going to be set apart, if they're going to live lives which are holy, it will be marked by faithfulness to our Lord Jesus. And actually, Jesus says that if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Faithfulness to Christ is absolutely paramount in our lives. And actually, faithfulness to Christ is more important than effectiveness. I want you to think about that. That sounds something quite easy off the tongue. But it's actually quite difficult to think about. It. What is the mark of a church? Is it to be effective or is it to be faithful? You're saying, Gav, why do you, make, why do you draw this distinction between the two? Actually, one of the reasons why I made the distinctions between the two is you can have big churches, but it doesn't mean that you're faithful. It just means that you've been effective in pulling a crowd. But actually, as Christian people, we are called to be people who are faithful. Actually, sometimes the first sign of faithfulness amongst God's people is this. is when actually God peels things away, when you get smaller. 
Actually, one of the things that I think will happen because of the pandemic and when churches get back to normal, can I say to you, I think a lot of churches will get smaller. But actually, if the fruit of that is actually we'll have, and one says, the faithful people will remain. The people who, where church has just become part or habit, we've got out of that habit in the last year. I'm not saying that this will happen in this church, but I'm just saying, <clears throat> as God's people, we're called to be people who are faithful. But notice how else does he describe them? Holy, faithful, and then some of you read the word brothers. And some of you, if you're about a feminist, you're going, hang on a minute, what about the sisters? Actually, can I say to you, you don't need to worry about that. I want to explain why. And maybe this is some about knowledge again. The word there is actually the word Adelphi, which means simply the household of God. So he writes, he's an, it's an inclusive term, it's not an exclusive term. So actually, he writes to remind them that actually you are part of the household of God. You're part of the family of God in Colossians. And I'm coming and I'm writing to remind you and encourage you to remain faithful to Christ in uncertain times. Where there's going to be pressures. And I'm going to say to you, I'm not coming with an apostle mandate. But I am coming in one sense with a pastoral oversight. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to exhort us. I believe that we have came through an uncertain time in the last year. But now I want to exhort us together to keep pursuing holiness and faithfulness to our Lord Jesus Christ. Because one thing that I do know about this is this. Sorry, I'm very dry. It's that in these times where our foundations have been shaken, I know that Christ alone is a sure foundation. And isn't that encouraging to know that? That he is our rock. He is our fortress. And we can look to him. But he doesn't just stop there. He writes to remind them of the descriptions of what their character should be. But then he flips them looking at their character to the very character and the nature of God. Again, look at verse 2. He says, grace Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Grace is the substance and the message of Christianity, isn't it? You know, if you look at grace, doesn't just define, dare I say, a statement of a fact, but reveals who Jesus is at his heart. Remember the heart of Jesus' ministry. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. But grace, God's, remember, Paul would write to those believers in Colossae, remember God's lavish kindness on us, which we didn't deserve. And actually, he, his grace hasn't just saved us, but his grace will continue to sustain you in that work of ministry. And likewise, God's grace will continue to sustain us in these uncertain times. I love the book of Ephesians. I was really, uh, when God told me to preach through Colossians, I was delighted, but I often thought about Ephesians before. But Ephesians says, For it is by grace you have been saved, not by words which man should boast. That is the gift of God. But alongside that, we often quote that verse, but we forget verse 10, which actually says that God has prepared good works in advance for us to do. And that's the thing about grace. Grace doesn't just save, it sustains. Grace isn't cheap. Grace is costly. So actually, when Paul writes, remember, grace, 
to you. He says, remember that grace will be faithful. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Yeah. See? Do you see it? And that's actually really interesting. When you, when, you know, when you can see grace, actually it changes your perspective and discipleship. It changes how you see people. It, see, it changes how you see situations. That's why Paul would say, grace and peace to you from our Lord, from God our Father. Notice those words, peace to you. There Paul isn't talking about the absence of conflict. But when he talks about peace, it's actually the word, dare I say, the word is shalom. And actually what he's talking about there is that he wants the believers in Colossae to know God's well-being in their every area of their lives. So peace with God, but also peace with one another. Again, when we come to this verse later on in our studies and cautions, probably be in about six months' time, the pace that I'm going. But it says, let the peace of Christ ruin your hearts. I want you to think about that. Have you let God's peace rule in your hearts? As a community, when you go through times where things are unsettling, Paul would say, remember, remember the peace which Jesus gives. John 14, 27. My peace, Jesus says, I give to you. That peace that the world doesn't give. That peace which, you know, which surpasses all understanding, which can guard your heart and your mind in Christ. That's what Paul long said that believers would experience. Not just that they would know in their heads cerebrally, but that they would experience tangibly in their hearts. I wonder how many of you need to know peace in your hearts this morning. Maybe some of you do. And there's no shame in admitting that. Paul writes this after all to believers. And I think actually one of the reasons why he's quite clear on this, right at the start of this letter, grace and peace to you, is actually it comes in a person. See, peace, if you think of it in this context, if Paul's writing to people who are facing the threat of persecution, facing the threat for some of them maybe of even their lives, I'm sure that you don't always know peace in, in those circumstances. I'm sure that there's times where they would go through fear. Maybe that's why he wants to exhort them at right the start. Grace and peace to you. I'm not saying for any of us in the next year, we're going to go through times where we're going to have to lay down our lives. Although we don't know. But one thing that being a pastor has taught me is this. I do know as Christians, we do go through times where our hearts and our peace is robbed and you don't need to be a pastor to know that. Just being a Christian, you know that. But in the midst of that uncertainty, in the midst where your peace is someone's and shaken, how do you respond to that? Well, actually, Paul in an hour letter in Philippines would write, don't be anxious about anything, but in prayer and petition, send your request to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Paul writes, right the star to this group of believers facing uncertainty, 
I want you to know that peace. I wonder, how are you feeling in your spirits? Calm, relaxed? Maybe your peace has been unsettled in the last year. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said this. It's, this is off my script, but it's, it's a prompt that I feel led that I need to share. And he said, it's a wonderful comfort for the Christian to know that they can lay their head on this soft pillow of God's sovereignty. I want you to think about that image. The soft pillow of God's sovereignty. I think this is a wonderfully encouraging passage. Right at the start of Colossians 1. He writes, grace and peace to you. And then notice these words. From God our Notice it, speak out, power. And that's actually the wonderful truth that we come before God and worship, not just to one who's above all powers, who's above all kings, but actually we come before him as a community of God's people. Likewise, these early believers, we hold on to the fact that God is our power. I have a firm conviction, and my conviction is this, not just is discipleship important, and we'd all say amen to that. But one of my our firm convictions is this. As believers, we need to grasp how much God, our Father, really loves us. How much he really cares for us. And I actually noticed those words, it was from God, our Father. It was a gift to be received from him. Can I say to you, God is a power who won't disappoint you. God is a power to the powerless. Some of us may have had earthly powers who were never there for us. And that's painful and that's difficult. And sometimes the consequence of that is we project God as our heavenly power. We have that. We project those images onto him. But can I say to you, God, your heavenly Father, wants to pour out his grace, pour out his peace, pour out his love on these believers in Colossae, but likewise here. And I just think for some of us, we just need to hold on to that truth. Paul writes to exhort them. And I write, not, not write, but I speak, and I want to exhort you as God's people today to be people set apart. We would all say, Amen. I hope. Uh, I, would, I think we would always sort one hour, yes, we want to be faithful. And again, we would say, yes, Lord, Amen. But when we come to that point, we want to exhort people to know God's grace. We would say, yes, Amen. Also, we want to exhort one another to live in the peace and know that you're loved by your Father. And your Father loved you so much that he sent his one and only Son to die on that cross so that you could stand forgiven, so that you can know grace, so that you can know peace with God. And that's what gives us hope. So that we too can stand for him faithfully. So we can trust in the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ. In uncertain times we can still declare that Jesus is Lord of our lives. May we hold on to Christ. But you know what? Without my glasses... I need a bit of a spiritual eye test. But thank God, when I put them on, everything is clear. And my prayer is as we do this series together in cautions, that we'll have a clearer vision 
of Jesus together. Amen.
place How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see it was grace that so
And a quick word from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all.